Hi everyone, it's Katrina. I'm a little sick today, but hopefully you can stick with me. Today, I'm going to show you some of the greatest mega projects of the ancient world. Destroyed projects like the Colossus of Rhodes and failed projects like Paris's triumphant elephant. Let's go. Karahan Tepe. Karahan Tepe is one of the oldest mega projects in existence. It's considered one of the world's oldest temples, perhaps even older than its more famous cousin, Gobekli Tepe. It's 11,000 years old. Just stop for a second and think how ancient that is. Woolly mammoths were in the middle of going extinct 11,000 years ago, or had very recently gone extinct. Scientists believe Karahan Tepe was the result of human beings coming together for the first time to build something greater than themselves. It's located in Turkey, in the archaeological zone of Tas Tepeler. First discovered in 1997, the Stone Age temple only recently came to international attention. There was a survey carried out in 2000, but it didn't make any. The excavation revealed pools carved into the bedrock, pestles, and grindstones. Archaeologists also found blades, tools made of obsidian, and dozens of other prehistoric implements. It wasn't until the unveiling of 266 pillars that Karahan Tepe shot to fame. This was a site that took an even greater genius to build than Stonehenge, which came thousands of years after. The almost 300 pillars are decorated in beautiful reliefs of insects, birds, gazelles, serpents, and unidentified animals that confuse the experts. When it was completed, Karahan Tepe would have been a humbling monument to see. What makes the whole thing even crazier is that Gobekli Tepe is only a few miles west, with the lesser-known Sefer Tepe even closer to the north. This was a landscape molded by human hands at a time when, until recently, scientists thought people were still dwelling in caves. But no, Karahan Tepe required architectural know-how. This is the world's first truly sophisticated work of human engineering, completed by alleged cavemen. But what was it for? What was the point of building it? That is the ultimate mystery that scientists hope one day to discover. Current theories include everything from aliens to the inception of religion to the real-life Garden of Eden. The humongous temple might have been part of a much larger ritualistic complex. Ceremonies may have been held here. Unbelievable rituals could have taken place in the shadows of the towering stone columns. One more thing before moving on to other incredible mega-projects. Karahan Tepe wasn't abandoned like most ancient places were. The builders didn't just pack up and leave when they got bored. They intentionally buried the whole temple deep in the ground so that nobody would ever find it. Their plan worked until the end of the 20th century. For 11,000 years, the world's first and perhaps the greatest mega-project remained intentionally buried. The Elephant of the Bastille I'm going to tell you about a pair of giant elephants, one of which is gone and forgotten, and the other that never saw the light of day. Close your eyes. Try to imagine a gigantic bronze elephant standing nearly 100 feet tall in the middle of Paris. If you lived in the early 19th century, you didn't need to imagine it because the elephant was real, though not many people saw it. The Elephant of the Bastille was a colossal statue dreamed up by Napoleon Bonaparte in 1808. Building commenced in 1810 but ceased in 1815 with the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo. The statue was intended to stand triumphantly in the Place de la Bastille. The Place de la Bastille has a whole crazy history of its own. The Bastille prison once stood in the square, up until it was destroyed in 1789 during the French Revolution. Not a single piece of the prison remains anymore. But it was once a massive jailhouse with a detachment of grenadiers and mercenaries. In July 1789, a crowd of angry Parisians stormed the courtyard, eventually tearing it down brick by brick. In 1792, the Bastille was transformed into a square meant to commemorate liberty. The Fountain of Regeneration was built, inspired by ancient Egypt. Napoleon, for all his warmongering, did plan a lot of regeneration projects in Paris. He was especially fond of monuments, which was how he got the idea for the giant bronze elephant. He wanted it cast entirely from bronze taken from guns at the Battle of Friedland. Oh, how glorious the giant bronze elephant would have been! The Eiffel Tower is impressive, but the elephant would have been way cooler! Construction of a full-size plaster model shaped over a wooden frame was completed in 1814. The humongous model was protected by a guard who made his house inside one of the elephant's hollow legs. But then, in 1815, with Napoleon's defeat, construction stopped. 
A few people tried to gain support to complete the project, but nobody would cough up the money. The elephant, unfinished but still huge, stood near the Bastille until 1846 when it was demolished. Though the locals complained about it for at least 20 years, because it had grown into a home for rats and vagabonds. These days, the Place de la Bastille is home to the July Column, commemorating the July Revolution of 1830. But wait, there is more! To learn about the other giant elephant mega project from Paris, keep watching because it's coming up soon! Is Mount Roraima a failed mega project? Mount Roraima in Venezuela has been called the most mysterious geological formation in the history of the world. But is this epic formation geological or artificial? For over 500 years, scientists have failed to understand the unique origin of this fantastic place. Let's check out some of the facts before dipping our toes into the theories. The mountain rises a cool 9,000 feet above sea level. It looks almost like a wedge of cheese. Its edges look as if they were cut with a huge, earth-cutting kitchen knife. Even the top of the mountain is perfectly flat. It doesn't have a peak instead having an even plateau from one side to the other. In simple terms, the summit is horizontal. Its edges are cluttered by waterfalls and cliffs so steep they make your palms sweat just thinking about it. Plus, it's usually shrouded in a dense mist. Geologists have suggested Mount Roraima was created by a bone-shattering earthquake in the past, but there is no certainty because the mountain's shape is so unique. Moving to the more mythical side of the equation, I'll introduce you to the Pemon. They are the indigenous people who have lived in the forested hills of Venezuela, Brazil, and Guiana for centuries. In their mythology, which is an interesting mix of indigenous beliefs and Christian ideals, God is said to live in the grasslands at the top of the mountain. The Bemon also believe Mount Roraima is off-limits to mortal humans. Nobody climbed to the top for centuries because they feared gods lived upon its summit and would punish them. There are even tales of strange creatures that live atop the mountain. Could Mount Roraima have been home to an advanced civilization who sculpted the mountain to suit their needs? It's certainly possible, though no physical evidence has been found. There are no ruins that scientists know about, although it's not like there have been many scientific expeditions to this isolated place. Maybe there were gods here at one time, living high in the clouds on an earthen platform of their own making. The Colossus of Rhodes the Colossus of Rhodes was such an ambitious project in the 3rd century BC that it couldn't stand on its own two legs for more than five decades. The literal Colossus crumbled after only 50 years standing. The Colossus of Rhodes is on the official list of the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World. It was put on the list by Greek poet Antipater of Sidon. He was the one who traveled around the known world in the 2nd century BC and formulated a list of the most impressive projects. To put things in a way even the youngest generation can understand, Antipater of Sidon was like the world's first vlogger. He traveled around, wrote about the places he visited, and made a list of must-see destinations. The Seven Wonders of the Ancient World were part of his ultimate travel guide. Time didn't do any favors to the places on the list. Wars, restless winds, shifting tectonic plates, and fire have brought most of them to ruin. The only one still standing is the Pyramid of Giza. The Pharos of Alexandria is gone. The Temple of Artemis at Ephesus is no more. The Mausoleum at Halicarnassus is a tragic ruin. But unlike these other fallen wonders, there is no physical evidence the Colossus of Rhodes ever existed. The only evidence is in historical records. According to multiple Greek historians, the Colossus was built by the people of Rhodes as a statue of Helios, one of the titans in Greek myth. Helios drove his sun chariot across the sky every day to bring the world light. The people of Rhodes gathered an obscene amount of bronze from across the globe to build the statue. It took 12 years to complete, but it was amazing. It was the biggest and most awe-inspiring statue in the known world. The Colossus supposedly stood 110 feet tall, a single one of its toes bigger than most normal statues. It may have stood a lot longer if not for what happened in 225 BC, when an earthquake hit. The quake shook the ground, causing the statue to break at the knees and crumble. There were no funds left to rebuild it, so the Colossus remained lying fragmented on the ground. Pliny the Elder wrote in the 1st century AD that the giant was still a marvel even shattered. One hundred years later, Lucian of Samosata claimed the Colossus could be seen from the moon. What happened to its pieces is a mystery. 
By the 7th century, the Muslims had captured Rhodes, and after that, the Colossus disappeared. The Second Sphinx Ask anyone who is in love with ancient Egypt who built the Great Pyramid, they'll almost unanimously know the answer. It was Pharaoh Khufu over 4,500 years ago. But ask those same people who built the Sphinx, they more than likely won't know the answer. The thing is, the Sphinx is even more mysterious than the pyramids. Scientists are not completely helpless. They do have a working theory, although there isn't irrefutable proof of it. It's believed the Great Sphinx was commissioned by Pharaoh Khafre in 2500 BC. Give or take a few decades, he was the builder of the Second Pyramid at Giza. The monolith was likely carved directly from the bedrock of the Giza Plateau. And while plenty of archaeologists back the theory, such as famous Egyptologist Zahi Hawass, it's still just a theory. Speaking of theories, get ready to have your mind blown. The Great Sphinx may have been one of the most impressive megaprojects of ancient Egypt, but not because of what you can see today. Rumor has it, the Sphinx was built to cover a secret library that contained knowledge of the Ancient Ones. By Ancient Ones, I mean the supposed deities who came down from the stars and ruled Egypt prior to known history. Some scholars think that if you dig beneath the Sphinx's paws, you'll break into a chamber containing unimaginable treasure. Then there's the theory of the Second Sphinx, which is rooted a little more in observable reality. There appears to be evidence that the Great Sphinx had a twin, another stone monument that has been forgotten for thousands of years. Reda Abdel Halim, the director of public relations at the Giza Pyramids in 2021, claimed that he discovered the Second Sphinx. He told Cairo Live that he found a missing statue in the area of the pyramids that's almost identical in size to the Great Sphinx. But if this is true, why hasn't there been anything about it in the news? Reda is a tourist official, not a legit scientist. When he was pressed for evidence, he claimed scientists from Zagazig University conducted a study that found the other monument. However, it's been almost three years and nothing much has happened. Most experts think Reda was trying to create publicity to bring tourists back to Egypt. If this is all a little confusing, I get it. But here's the one thing you need to know. The archaeological community as a whole is behind the idea of another sphinx. If there are three pyramids, there were likely three sphinxes at one point. But as of now, the others remain missing. The Roman Amphitheater of Alexandria no video on ancient megaprojects would be complete without at least mentioning one epic Roman theater. In that case, let me tell you a bit about the Roman amphitheater in Alexandria. It's the only one of its kind in Egypt, but it's not like a traditional amphitheater. It was built to be a small, cozy theater rather than a sporting arena where gladiators fought to the death. Nobody initially knew that the amphitheater was here. It had been completely lost to the ages. Only when a team of curious archaeologists started digging in search of Alexander the Great's missing tomb did they find it. The bones of Alexander are still lost, but this 4th century marvel is preserved for everyone to see. The ruins are still standing, nicely protected thanks to the diligent care of experts. The original marble seating is intact, along with a few mosaics that decorated the courtyard. One of the coolest aspects is the graffiti etched into pieces of stone. The graffiti is related to the rivalry between supporters of local chariot teams. People were bashing the opposing teams by carving snide remarks into the very foundations of the theater. It's the Roman equivalent of writing you suck on a modern baseball stadium's wall. Further research still needs to be carried out. And to be honest, scientists are only guessing at precisely what happened in the theater. Some experts have suggested it may have been a lecture hall, not a theater at all. The building may have been connected to an ancient academic institution, maybe one of the earliest universities in Egypt. Some even think it was connected to the Great Library of Alexandria, used by scholars in Egypt's golden age of wisdom. And now for a quick break, but first, it's shout out time! I want to give a big thank you to David Fowler and Deanna Judd for supporting this channel. We wouldn't be here without you. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like this. Roosevelt Island Civic Center Roosevelt Island almost looked a lot different. At the turn of the 20th century, there was a push to bring beautiful designs into America. 
architects proposed countless building projects, hoping to create modern equivalents of grand structures like the Acropolis in Athens, one of the greatest proposals was a civic center on Roosevelt Island. These days, Roosevelt Island lies underneath the Queensboro Bridge. In the 17th century, it was a wild place called Hog Island, purchased from the Canarsie tribe by the Dutch. When the Dutch were defeated by the British in 1664, the island's name was changed to Manning Island. Twenty years later, the name was changed again to Blackwell Island. It was on this thin sliver of land that the Blackwell House was constructed in 1796. It's currently one of very few surviving examples of 18th century architecture in New York. The island had a tragic history in the 19th century. It housed mostly hospitals and prisons. When the city of New York purchased the island, the entire island, for the princely sum of $32,000, equivalent to $850,000 in modern money, they built a penitentiary. Then, in 1839, the New York City Lunatic Asylum opened. This could have been such a grand place, but instead the island was covered in prisons and mental hospitals. In 1852, a smaller prison for petty violators opened, and four years later, a hospital to treat people suffering from smallpox opened. In 1872, a Gothic lighthouse was added, which was pretty easy to build seeing as there were so many prisoners around. The lighthouse was built using convict labor. The last convicts didn't get removed from the island until 1935, when most of them were shipped to Rikers. But what could have been? That's what I'm here to tell you about the mega-project that never was. In the early 1900s, Blackwell Island was almost turned into a civil center. The exciting proposal would have seen two new bridges be installed, with one of them passing through the dome of a grand new municipal building. There would have been esplanades at either end of the island, with Greek-styled promenades stretching along the riverfronts of both Manhattan and Long Island City. The proposed municipal building was designed to be seven blocks in length, the central tower would have climbed 600 feet into the clouds. The idea was that because Roosevelt Island is so small, nothing would ever crowd the Civic Center. There would never be taller buildings next to it because the center would take up the entire island. As you may be well aware, this ambitious project never got started. Now the island is heavily covered in residential structures, with a few no-car zones that are quite nice. The Triumphal Elephant one of Paris's most iconic monuments is the Arc de Triomphe, but it almost never got built. A few decades before construction began on the Arc, there was a proposal for a giant elephant to be built. There is just something about French architects and giant elephants, I don't know what it is. In 1758, architect Charles-François Ribart designed an incredible monument to King Louis XV a way to commemorate the French victory in the War of the Austrian Succession. There were a lot of proposals, but none more awesome than the triumphal elephant. The design was baffling and weirdly futuristic for the time. Ribard wanted people to climb up the structure, moving vertically up a tower in the core of the humongous elephant. There was supposed to be a fountain gushing out of the elephant's trunk plus a statue of Louis XV at the very top. Inside, the monumental pachyderm was to be a garden. Several flights of stairs would lead through a series of chambers to an observation room on the elephant's back. It was a really cool design that was way too complicated to ever work. The triumphal elephant never saw the light of day, and decades later, the Arc de Triomphe was built. Would you like to see this mega-project come to life? Let me know in the comments! The Diolcos Trackway before there was the Great American Railway, there was the Diolcos Trackway. It was a limestone track built in the days of ancient Greece to transport boats across a vast stretch of land. About 2,600 years ago, the Greeks were having an issue with the Isthmus of Corinth. The narrow stretch of land separated the Gulf of Corinth from the Saronic Gulf, making life hard for sailors and merchants. The Greeks knew that if they could just cut a small pathway from one gulf to the other, like the Panama Canal, 
they would open up endless possibilities for trade and navigation. You can bet your bottom dollar the Greeks were not going to let Earth itself stand in their way. In the 6th century BC, the Greeks split the world. They carved a smooth passageway into the isthmus and paved it. The Diolkos trackway was about 20 feet wide and paved just like any modern road. Being able to move ships across the isthmus made the journey about 700 times shorter. The trip went from 434 miles at sea to about 3 miles across land. The trackway is generally regarded as one of the most impressive engineering projects of the ancient world, but it is still shrouded in mystery. It's unclear exactly when the trackway was built or who initiated the project. Scientists don't even know how it was used to get ships from one side to the other. The Greeks likely used something like a wheeled platform. The device must have been ingenious. It had to pull the ship out of the water, then drag it three miles across cobblestones and dump it back into the sea. The cobblestones are still there today. You can walk the length of the trackway, retracing the steps of ancient Greece's greatest engineering minds. The 1880 Channel Tunnel The Channel Tunnel is one of the greatest modern engineering marvels. In the 1980s, rock was excavated underneath the English Channel to connect the United Kingdom with mainland Europe. It's the longest undersea tunnel in the world, an incredible 31 miles long. Every year, over 10 million passengers travel through the tunnel. There are even plans for a second tunnel between England and France, though the project hasn't started yet. What you might be surprised to learn is that people have been trying to build a tunnel between England and France for centuries. The Channel Tunnel of the 1980s was the result of 200 years of planning. It wasn't even the first attempt, and it almost wasn't allowed to happen. There were major safety concerns before the project went forward. According to Eurotunnel spokesman John Keefe, it was considered unsafe. There were concerns that if a car crash happened 15 miles out at sea, reaching the victims would be extraordinarily difficult. But in the end, the technology was ready and the tunnel was built. It was a lot better than the first time England tried to build a tunnel in 1880, 100 years earlier. One of the big supporters of the tunnel project was Napoleon Bonaparte. Even with the conflict between England and France, the two nations agreed simultaneously to build a tunnel. Putting historical differences aside, connecting the two countries seemed like a no-brainer. In 1877, shafts had been sunk at Sangat on the French side and east of Dover on the English side. Welsh miners bored 800 feet of tunnel at Shakespeare Cliff in 1881. The goal was to continue digging until the British miners reached a midway point, where the French diggers would meet them. I know that this was in 1880, but the workers did have machines. They weren't using chisels and hammers like Neanderthals. Both tunnels were carved using a rotary boring machine patented by Captain Thomas English of Kent. Everything was off to a great start, but then came the paranoia. English bureaucrats began fretting about the link between their safe island and mainland Europe. England had been a naval superpower for a very long time. They really enjoyed being sheltered on their island. Being connected to France suddenly seemed like it could have calamitous implications. Bureaucrats began sounding the alarm that with a tunnel, there was always a chance an army could seize it and attack England. There were others who argued against the paranoia. Sir Edward said nobody would ever take the tunnel because the British could flood it or fill it with smoke and suffocate everyone inside. Suddenly, the funds that had been put aside to complete the tunnel vanished. Then, in 1898, the Chancery Division of the High Court forbade any additional boring under the sea. The shafts were filled and the project was postponed for the next century. The Pillars of Hercules You've no doubt heard of the Pillars of Hercules before, most likely in relation to the story of Atlantis. Legendary philosopher Plato wrote that just beyond the Pillars of Hercules was where Atlantis stood, mighty and proud. Mighty until the gods plunged it into the sea. But just what are the Pillars of Hercules? Are these real pillars that Plato was talking about? They most likely weren't real, but maybe. Generally speaking, the Pillars of Hercules are two promontories which mark the entrance to the Mediterranean Sea. What's a promontory? A promontory is a rocky headland jutting out of the water. One of them is the Rock of Gibraltar, located on the European side. Then, on the African side of the Mediterranean is Jebel Musa. 
The promontories stand at opposite sides of the eastern entrance to the Strait of Gibraltar. It's an eight and a half mile mouth of water where the Mediterranean Sea meets the Atlantic Ocean, and also the divide between Africa and Europe. So these are not real pillars. But what if pillars had once stood on the rocky outcrops? To find the truth, let's look to legends. The very first known reference of the Pillars of Hercules comes from Greek poet Pisander 2,600 years ago. He wrote about Hercules' twelve labors. Hercules, the son of Zeus and a mortal woman, was cursed by Zeus's jealous wife Hera. She caused Hercules to succumb to a fit of madness in which he cut down his own wife and three children. When Hercules recovered from the madness, he was devastated by what he had done. Seeking atonement, he traveled to the oracle at Delphi. She told him to make amends for his crimes. This led Hercules to completing his legendary twelve labors. The tenth labor was to steal the cattle of Geryon. Geryon was a giant monstrosity who had three bodies and six hands, believed to be invincible. Hercules had to steal cattle from the monster and bring them to Eurystheus. To do this, Hercules traveled to the island of Erythea, far to the west of the Mediterranean. The pillars were supposedly built to mark the farthest extent of Hercules' travels. The pillars marked the end of the known world for the Greeks. Maybe the pillars really did stand at the Strait of Gibraltar. There is no evidence of them today, but there likely wouldn't be if they were built prior to 2600 BC. The only standing monument right now are the Pillars of Hercules at Ceuta. It's a modern statue of Hercules and a pair of bronze pillars. Created by Guinness Serran Pagan, it's the biggest bronze sculpture depicting a subject from Greek mythology anywhere in the world. The Duke's Tomb Some of the greatest mega-projects conducted in the ancient world involved burying people. In fact, nearly all of them had something to do with death, from the pyramids to the epic tomb of Duke Jing of Qi. Who in the world is Duke Jing? He was an important figure in Chinese history about 2,500 years ago. His mother was a concubine, and his father was Duke Ling of Qi. Sometime around 576 BC, following the death of his half-brother for having an affair with another man's wife, Duke Jing took the throne. Duke Jing ruled alongside Prime Minister Yan Ying until his death in 490 BC. His tomb was then forgotten until archaeologists rediscovered it in 1976. Well, it was actually a peasant who found it. The peasant found pieces of bronze in a field, and the discovery brought treasure hunters. Then it brought archaeologists, who have been periodically excavating for the last 50 years. The Duke's tomb was an incredible project. The vastness of his tomb and the number of animals buried in it is astonishing. Archaeologists have already identified 600 young steeds that were massacred and buried with the Duke. There is the Duke's burial area, then three sections filled to the brim with horse skeletons. Experts believe the horses were given alcohol and then brutally killed using a blunt weapon. Not only were the horses killed, but so were the horse trainers who raised them. This may have been so that the Duke had men around him in the afterlife to care for his army of horses. The Trafalgar Square Pyramid London would certainly be a much different place if it had a gigantic pyramid in the middle of the city, and it almost did. 200 years ago, a plan was conceived to build a ziggurat-style pyramid on Trafalgar Square. Why would the English want to build a pyramid? To understand, let's take a look at the guy who came up with the idea. Sir Frederick William Trench was an MP and soldier. He was pretty thrilled about the defeat of the French at the Battle of Trafalgar and wanted to commemorate the victory with a monument. In 1815, he initiated a campaign to gather funds to build a pyramid. It was meant to double as a monument and a subtle insult to the French, though maybe not so subtle. The taxpayers would have forked out roughly one million British pounds for the project. That was a staggering amount of money two centuries ago. The idea was solid. Sir Frederick wanted to not just commemorate the battle, but the whole war. It was to be 22 tiers tall, with each tier representing one year of the war fought against Napoleon. It was also going to be a source of income for soldiers who didn't have anything to do anymore since the war was over. It would take about five years to build, giving veterans a source of income at least for half a decade. The government didn't want to spend the money, so the pyramid idea was scrapped. These days, Trafalgar Square is mostly full of tourists and pigeons. The Round City of Baghdad 
The round city of Baghdad was not just a city, it was a landmark and a monument. It was a glorious testimony to the architectural genius of the human mind. 1,250 years ago, the foundations of the city were laid. It left its mark on the Middle East, though many have never even heard of it. The city of Baghdad itself isn't particularly ancient. Although there are a lot of ancient sites near Baghdad from the earliest chapters of human history in Mesopotamia, Baghdad was founded in 762. Al-Mansur the Victorious of the Abbasid dynasty created the city as the center of his Islamic kingdom. It was to be like the old cities of Babylon and Assyria, a real jewel of the world or like Uruk, believed to be the first true metropolis on the planet, established in 3200 BC. The round city of Baghdad was at the center of the universe. Work began on July 30th, the exact day astrologers said would be fortuitous to start. The brick walls rose in a circumference of four miles. Each chunk of wall was made of 162,000 bricks, give or take a few thousand. The outer wall was 80 feet high, with battlements and bastions to protect from invaders. It took thousands of architects and engineers to complete. And don't forget about the carpenters, blacksmiths, land surveyors, diggers, every specialization you can imagine. At the center of the city stood two structures, the Great Mosque and the Golden Gate Palace. This was the Caliph's Grand Palace, where he had homes for his staff, servants, and many, many children. The round city lasted longer than most places in ancient history. The last traces of it were demolished in the 1870s by the Ottomans. The city of Baghdad has survived, but the original round city is long gone. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Nan Madol Nan Madol is one of the oldest archaeological sites in the world and arguably one of the most remote. It was once an ancient city built on top of a coral reef. Located in the Pacific Ocean about 5,500 miles from California, it was built around the year 1200. The island belongs to the Federated States of Micronesia, but hundreds of years ago, Nan Madol was the capital of the mighty Sadalur dynasty. It has been nicknamed the Venice of the Pacific and the eighth wonder of the world. The Saudalurs were said to be the descendants of two mysterious magical brothers who founded a religious community here in the 6th century. The religious aristocracy began to divide into cults over the years. The Saudalur tribe leaders were extremely oppressive, and according to oral history, the native people were often forced to starvation. These people built a great city on top of the coral reef inside of a lagoon off the eastern coast of the island. They created a system of artificial islands, each linked by its own canal. There are nearly 100 artificial islands still in the lagoon today, crafted from a mixture of basalt and coral which is unlike so many buildings of the ancient world that were built with brick and mud. According to archaeologist Rufino Mauricio, the people of Pompeii needed to move roughly 2,000 tons of basalt rock every year for 400 years consecutively to create Nan Madol, and nobody knows how they did it. The floating city of coral probably held about 25,000 people. It took about 800 years to finish their great city, but by the 18th century, the city was completely abandoned. The people of Nan Madol were invaded by a legendary hero named Iso Kelakel with the help of Sadulurs who had defected, and the ruling dynasty was deposed. Nan Madol is the only existing ancient city built on top of a coral reef and is now owned by the modern-day Nan Muarki people, who trace their lineage back to that demigod hero. You can go and visit the ancient city of Nan Madol for yourself. Ancient Varanasi Varanasi in India is the raw, beating heart of Hinduism. It's one of the most holy cities in the world and can be found sitting along the Ganges River in North India. While today we know this place as Varanasi, its original name was Banaras and it's considered the oldest colonized city in the entire world. In fact, Mark Twain described the city as older than history and older than tradition itself. Varanasi is where people come from all over India to die. It's not actually as morbid as it sounds, because in Hinduism, death is just another part of the cycle of life. Hindus believe in a cosmic loop, a never-ending cycle of life and death called samsara. When a person dies, their soul moves on to another body and another place in time. There is 
is also the belief that if one perishes in the holy place of Varanasi, they may break the cycle and achieve nirvana. For this reason, Varanasi is one of the most popular places in the world to shed one's mortal vessel. It's also filled with architectural wonders. There are 88 ghats in the city, which are steps leading down to the Ganges River. These enormous steps are used for a wide range of things, from bathing to religious ceremonies, for getting on tourist boats, and for cremating the dead. Fires burn here non-stop, with about 80 bodies a day being cremated and then dumped in the river from these ancient staircases. That's not all. Varanasi is home to over 300 important monuments. One of them is the Tilted Temple, considered the most photographed temple in the whole city. It's bizarre because it leans roughly 9 degrees to the northwest, with most of the temple submerged underwater, except when the river dries up in the summer. Macedonian Tomb The tomb of Lysen and Callicles was built along the ancient road which once connected the towns of Mietza and Pella, the latter being the old capital of the Macedonian Kingdom. The reason the tomb is such an impressive structure is that even after over 2,000 years, the paintings on the walls look as though they were done yesterday. Nowhere else in Old Macedonia is a tomb quite as remarkably preserved as this one. The tomb is absolutely enormous. It was originally built for the sons of Aristophanes, Lysen, and Callicles around the year 250 BC. And then, for about 100 years, the tomb continued to be used as the resting place for both their descendants. It didn't go out of use until the Romans showed up and utterly decimated the Macedonians. The tomb itself contained two massive vaulted chambers, along with a typical antechamber and the burial chamber. The door which leads into the burial chamber has the names of the first two brothers carved into the stone. That's how we know who it was for. Then inside, there are 25 niches in the walls for the deceased. 17 of them once housed ashes and grave goods. The real treasure, though, is the artwork. The tomb was found completely by accident and when it was found, the researchers tried to keep everything as sealed as possible. The humidity and temperature were maintained, and so the vivid colors have continued to be preserved. The paintings show helmets and weapons, different types of Macedonian shields, and full suits of Macedonian armor, as well as decorative medallions and plants. The Cairn of Barnanay The Cairn of Barnanay is an extremely impressive burial mound in Brittany, France, located on top of a tall hill that overlooks the Bay of Morlaix. All all kinds of cairns can be found across Europe, dating back thousands of years. Normally, burial cairns are small. A person would die and be covered with a small pile of stones to protect them, and that was that. But in Brittany, the Cairn of Barnanay is truly gigantic. It was built starting 4,500 BC in the early Neolithic period. To put that into perspective, the pyramids of Giza date roughly back to 2550 BC. According to scientists, the burial cairn is one of the earliest megalithic monuments anywhere on the planet, and also one of the oldest structures ever built by human hands. But in typical human fashion, we nearly destroyed it. Even though it was mapped by French researchers in 1807, it became privately owned and was used as a quarry for paving stones. The ancient monument was nearly completely taken apart before the local community revolted and took back control of the site. What's left today is still a monument of huge proportions. It's built of roughly 14,000 tons of stone and has 11 internal chambers connected like a honeycomb. It is without a doubt the most impressive burial site up until the Egyptians started digging tombs in the Valley of the Kings roughly 2,000 years later. The Unfinished Obelisk There is a structure unlike any other located in Aswan, Egypt. It's the largest ancient obelisk in Egypt and it's so big that it was never actually erected. It's appropriately called the Unfinished Obelisk, and it's still lying in the northern quarries where it was originally carved at the order of Queen Hatshepsut before her death in 1458 BC. It was probably meant to be added to the mighty Temple of Karnak, but it never made it out of the quarry. Obelisks are carved in one single block of stone that has to be strong enough to be carved out and then lifted straight into the air. If this obelisk had indeed been put up, it would have reached an astounding height of over 100 and 30 feet. That's 30 feet higher than the largest finished obelisk in Egypt, the Lateran Obelisk. It weighs about 1,200 tons, and researchers aren't sure why it wasn't completed. The main theory is that it was so big that the structure started to crack, so there was no way the workers would have been able to lift the obelisk straight up without the whole thing crumbling to pieces. It shows the ambition of the ancient Egyptians and has opened a window into their building process. 
and it shows us that even the amazing advanced Egyptians sometimes made mistakes. I want to give a big shout out to Seti and Ryan Dore. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the Origins Explained family. Aqueduct Technology You may have heard of the Nazca Lines, the incredible and mysterious geoglyphs found in the desert of Peru's Nazca region. What you may not know is that the lines are named after a very special ancient culture, the Nazca culture. They dominated the desert landscape of Peru's southern coast, and yet they never had any issues growing crops. Somehow, over 1,000 years ago, the ancient Nazca built miles of ingenious underground aqueducts. According to Alberto Martorell, an expert on aqueduct technology, the aqueducts were built between 300 and 500 AD, making them roughly 1,700 years old. And yet despite their age, the aqueducts could still work today if people actually set their minds to using them. The Nazca used the series of underground structures as tunnels for carrying water throughout the desert, irrigating crops, and turning what was a barren wasteland into a beautiful green oasis. This allowed the culture to flourish and develop in a way they never would have been able to do otherwise. How did ancient aqueducts work? The Nazca designed water collection structures to capture water coming down from the Andes Mountains and from nearby rivers and springs. That water was redirected underground into the aqueduct system, brought deep into the desert, and brought back to the surface to water the crops. It was a brilliant feat of engineering that still survives today, with the water catcher still there in the desert, just waiting for someone to use them. Lycian Rock Tombs In Fethiye, Turkey, there is a group of rock tombs carved into the side of a mountain, and they are a truly marvelous sight to behold. They were built high up into the sky, so that it was easier for the angels to reach the dead and bring them to the afterlife. At least, this is what the ancient Lycians believed. Dating all the way back to the 4th century, the Lycians believed that every single dead person was carried into the afterlife by some kind of magical creature with wings. Perhaps they were angels or fairies, it's hard to say what the Lycians would have called them. But whatever they were, they came down and scooped the dead out of their graves and brought them to a place where they could rest. To make the job easier on these winged beings, the Lycians started burying their dead high up in the mountains. Over 1,500 years later, many of the tombs are still around. But very few of the tombs are actually worth looking at since most have been vandalized or destroyed. Some of them are monumental, looking like ancient doorways into some kind of dwarven stronghold inside the mountain. Others are a little duller, decayed to nothing but foxholes barely distinguishable on the mountainside, with the interior chambers long since collapsed in on themselves. Temple Mount One of the most important places in all of Israel is the Temple Mount. It's not actually a temple, but a hill located in the old city of Jerusalem that's considered a holy site by the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims, and it has been for thousands of years. It is said to be the site where Abraham demonstrated his devotion to God by sacrificing his son Isaac. It is also the place where creation began and where the prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven, so needless to say, it is the cause of much religious tension. These days, Temple Mount is totally flat, a huge plaza surrounded by retaining walls. It is also home to his Islamic temples that date back to the 7th century AD. These temples are inside the retaining walls of a much older structure that dates back 2,000 years. The walls were originally built by the great King Herod in the 1st century BC. It was all part of the renovation project to revamp the second temple. He expanded and enclosed the holy site with huge limestone blocks going up 100 feet high. Archaeologist Gabby Barkay says that Herod wanted to compete with God and would make things bigger and better whenever he could. In the year 957 BC, King Solomon, the son of the biblical King David, constructed the first temple according to Jewish tradition and scripture. It would have been the biggest, most impressive temple in all of the world, but then it was destroyed by the Babylonians 400 years later. The issue today is that because Temple Mount is considered so holy, nobody has ever been able to dig underneath it. It is under Israeli sovereignty, but also administered by the Muslim religious trust. So while people are allowed to visit, Jewish prayer is forbidden at the site. There haven't been many archaeological excavations, and there is no evidence of the first temple. Researchers have found evidence that the second temple was a grand place, full of decorated floor tiles, glass, and ivory artifacts. The Unfinished Pyramid The Pyramid of Bikaris is known as the Unfinished Pyramid, and it can be found as Ayat el Aryan in Egypt. As the name suggests, the pyramid was started, but never finished. 
There is actually a collection of pyramids and an ancient necropolis. The area has been a restricted military base since the 1960s, so access to the pyramids is limited. No excavations have been allowed since then, and it is hard to learn more. Scholars believe it started being built around 2613 BC, during the Old Kingdom period. However, nobody knows who the main pyramid was being built for. Let's look at just how impressive the structure would have been had the project come to its completion. What we know comes from the square base, the only part that was ever actually finished. It measures about 660 by 660 feet. The exact planned size is unknown, and we don't know how grand the whole thing was supposed to be. Zayed El Aryan is surrounded by five cemeteries from the First Dynasty all the way to the Roman period. There are burial shafts leading to tombs, and before the area was restricted, researchers found a pink granite sarcophagus and possible chambers. New excavations with modern technology would probably reveal some incredible secrets. Baalbek Stone About a decade ago, the largest man-made block ever was found in Lebanon. Just like the impossible unfinished obelisk in Egypt, the block was most likely never used because it was too big to carry. It's called the Baalbek Stone because it was uncovered at an ancient limestone quarry in Baalbek, Lebanon. German and Lebanese archaeologists excavated the monumental stone and measured it to be over 64 feet long and weighing 1,650 tons. That is preposterously big, especially considering the rock was carved around the year 27 BC. So, if the Baalbek Stone was that big, what in the world could it have possibly been intended for? Researchers believe it was the Romans who carved the stone to be used at their ancient outpost in Baalbek, which they called Heliopolis. They had possibly been hoping to use the gigantic stone in the temple dedicated to the god Jupiter, which is located fairly close to the quarry. If they had been successful in bringing the stone out of the quarry, that would have made it the biggest formed boulder used in a building project in antiquity and it would have made the Temple of Jupiter and Roman Heliopolis an even more amazing site than it already is. Aramu Muru While exploring the Peruvian countryside near Lake Titicaca in the early 1990s, mountaineering guide José Luis Delgado Mamani found a strange structure that looks almost like a portal. The abandoned stone carving has a smooth, flat surface and a six-and-a-half-foot-tall T-shaped alcove. The roughly 23-foot stone structure is thought to be an abandoned Inca construction project, but its purpose is unknown. Known as Aramu Muru and nicknamed Puerta de Ayumarca, or Gate of the Gods, the structure is the subject of local folklore claiming that people have disappeared through its doorway. Indigenous heroes went through the door, becoming immortal and living next to the gods. Stories also tell of strange sights near the portal, including tall men accompanied by glowing balls of lights walking through the doorway. Another legend says that Aramu Maro was an Incan priest that used a special golden disc, known as the Key of the Gods of the Seven Rays, to escape the Spanish and fled to the mountains. The door opened, and rumor has it that there is still light coming from the tunnel he left behind. Paranormal enthusiasts claim that they have actually traveled through the portal. Conspiracy theorists have suggested that Aramu Muru is a multi-dimensional doorway created by aliens. What do you think it was for? Let me know in the comments below! Church of San Giacomo di Rialto Venice, Italy has no shortage of old churches, but according to local legend, the Church of San Giacomo di Rialto is the city's oldest. The popular version of its history claims that the church was established on March 25, 421, the same day that Venice was founded. Located next to the historic Rialto Bridge, it was built by a carpenter with the help of residents from nearby Padua, according to historical documents dating back to the 14th century. The strange thing is that the building is missing from a map of Venice that was created in 1097, and its first known mention is in a document from 1152, suggesting that the church is much newer than it's rumored to be, but nobody can say for sure how old it really is. In addition to its age being a mystery, the Church of San Giacomo di Rialto possesses several strange features, including a one-handed clock with a rotated quadrant, putting noon on the left-handed side where 9 o'clock would normally be, and midnight to the right. The building also contains one of the last few Gothic porticos in Venice, which bears inscriptions encouraging merchants to be honest at the Rialto market, which took place in front of the church. There are several quirky things to be found here, but nobody knows much about them. They are just all surrounded by stories. Chemin de Bells 
In 2018, archaeologists from the French National Institute for Preventive Archaeological Research got a nice surprise. They discovered an exceptionally well-preserved megalithic site in the municipality of Massagny in the southeastern part of the country. Known as Chemin de Belles, the site offers extensive insight into the beliefs of the ancient people who lived there long ago. Ongoing excavations suggest that humans occupied this site not for centuries but for thousands of years. One Neolithic village built around a pre-existing stone megalith complex was traced back to the Courtayard culture, whose presence in the region dates as far back as 4,300 years. That's a really long time. The complex consists of a heavy stone pillar surrounded by smaller stone towers, with the 5-ton centerpiece measuring 11 feet long, 3.6 feet wide, and 3.3 feet high. Upon close examination, archaeologists notice that the megaliths bear distinctive engravings of mysterious patterns. There are 20 cup or scoop marks carved into the large stone arranged in the shape of a large U. Beneath the U are pitted indentations, and the top of the megalith contains engravings of intertwined chevrons. Two of the smaller slabs, both which were intentionally broken, contain geometric engravings forming quadrangular, herringbone, and cruciform patterns that appear to be deliberately but haphazardly ordered. The markings on both the small and large stones were carved in three distinct phases, and evidence suggests that different societies used the megaliths over decades or centuries. But researchers are unsure what the motivations and beliefs of the engravers were, and it's possible, perhaps even likely, that we'll never know. There is no way of telling whether the carvings had ritualistic purposes, if they were simply artistic expressions, if they were astronomical in nature, or if there was some other reason for creating them. Ku Yang Stone Arrangement At an undetermined time in history, the Djab Wurung Aboriginal people arranged a collection of volcanic stones in an eel or apostrophe-like shape near Lake Bolak in Western Victoria, Australia. The whole thing is 656 feet long. Although archaeologists have not dated the ancient site, it's a significant indigenous landmark in the area. It's believed to be 1,500 years old. Known as the Kuyang Stone Arrangement, the formation's proximity to the eel-filled Lake Bolak points toward a ceremonial relationship between ancient Aboriginal clans and eel farming, says local resident Neil Murray. During ancient times, as many as 1,000 indigenous people gathered annually to harvest and feast on eels and the stone eel may be where they congregated for ceremonies to ensure a bountiful harvest. The farmer whose land the arrangement sits on had a long-standing agreement with the local Aboriginal people to ensure that they could access and care for the stones. But the property owner passed away, and his son, who inherited the land, Adrian McMaster, recently destroyed part of the eel's tail to treat a thistle infestation that had taken over. Upon learning that he had partially ruined a sacred site, McMaster was apologetic and claimed that he had done so unknowingly, despite the Kuyang stone arrangement being an officially registered Aboriginal landmark and its importance being well known to the community. The matter is currently under investigation and McMaster received an order not to cause further damage to the site. Under the Aboriginal Heritage Act, Knowingly damaging an indigenous heritage site can carry a fine of up to $300,000. Chalcatzingo Located in the southern portion of Mexico's central highlands in the Valley of Morelos is Chalcatzingo, an ancient site dating back to the time of the oldest known Mesoamerican civilization, the Olmecs. First settled around 1500 BC, Chalcatzingo saw the emergence of a complex culture around 900 BC. The Olmec culture, whose heartland was in the tropical lowlands of south-central Mexico, is largely a mystery to experts. But elements of their architectural and artistic styles found at Chalcatzingo indicate that its settlers were of Olmec origin or had close ties to the civilization. Artifacts found here feature depictions of big-toothed wildcats, indicating that the residents shared in the Olmec worship of the jaguar. The images include renderings of big cats with odd features, like beaks, and engaging in strange and scary acts, including one carving that shows a ferocious jaguar disemboweling a human. It appears as though the settlement was situated along an intersection of trading routes that connected the Olmec with the Mesoamerican societies throughout Mexico. At its peak, Chalcatzingo had an estimated 500 to 1,000 inhabitants, who cultivated staple crops like maize, using water from a nearby mountain stream to nourish their terraced fields. 
When the Olmec civilization collapsed around 500 BC, Chalcatzingo experienced an abrupt decline. Researchers believe that numerous environmental factors contributed to the Olmec's demise elsewhere. And although these events did not directly affect Chalcatzingo, its residents likely endured a cultural decline and economic hardship from decreased trade and contact with other factions of the civilization. The extent of the Olmec culture and their ethnic origins are unknown, and we only know what the Aztecs called them, leaving the culture's self-designated name a mystery. Experts know little about their religion beyond jaguar worship and the use of symbols that seem to convey an organized belief system and a priesthood of some sort. Stephen Harris House In 1763, a well-to-do merchant named Stephen Harris built a house over a French Huguenot burial site on Benefit Street in Providence, Rhode Island. You know what they say, never build your house over a cemetery. He fell on hard times immediately after construction was finished, losing several of his merchant vessels at sea, and endured an ongoing string of hardships thereafter. Legend goes that several of Harris's children died, and others were stillborn. His wife became severely mentally ill and was confined to the home's second floor, where she reportedly shrieked and yelled out the window in French, despite not knowing the language. Rumors spread that a live birth has never occurred inside the house, which still stands today. The house remained in the Harris family for generations because they were unable to sell it, and it fell into disrepair by the 1920s, when the area became a slum. Then, in the 1970s, the current homeowner purchased the house and restored it. They seem to be happy there and have even responded to the home's alleged curse with humor by putting up gatepost signs in French. But old legends die hard, and curious visitors still find their way to the house, where the owner typically allows them five minutes to look around. Would you let tourists come visit your house? Let me know in the comments below! The disturbing dwelling inspired horror writer H.P. Lovecraft's 1937 short story The Shunned House, which incorporates elements of history and folklore into a disturbing supernatural tale loosely based on Harris's experiences. Warangal Fort while this is not your typical solid wall fortification, this elaborate construction was built as a stronghold for the ruling dynasty. Located in the southern Indian state of Telangana, Warangal Fort once had three circular fortifications surrounded by a moat, but it was meant more as a show of power for the Kakatiya dynasty, more than actual physical defense. King Ganapathi built Warangal Fort at the very beginning of the 13th century, and it was actually finished by his daughter. During the 16th century, the early rulers of the Qutub Shahi dynasty destroyed the fort, and it remains in ruins to this day. Some structures, such as the Grand Shiva Temple that once existed at the site, has disappeared. In fact, some believe that there were as many as 365 Shiva temples once at the site, which have been lost to history. It is most famous for its carved stone architectural features that show off the great skill of the architects and craftsmen. There are four enormous gateways and there were once 45 pillars that would have also been decorated. It's most likely that the site would have also been an enormous religious place. Warangal Fort attracts many visitors who come to admire the structure's detailed stone carvings and ornamental arched gateways that survived hundreds of years after their creation. Cerro Sechin In 1937, a pair of Peruvian archaeologists discovered the vast ruins of what appears to be the ancient capital of the Cosma Sechin society that lived throughout coastal northern Peru and in the valleys of the Cosma and Sechin rivers. Dating back to 2400 BC, the prehistoric archaeological site is known as Cerro Sechin and is located within the larger Sechin Alto complex which sits atop a granite hill 168 miles north of the modern-day capital city of Lima. It contains megalithic architecture, a stepped pyramid surrounded by buildings, and a 13-and-a-half-foot-tall retaining wall around the perimeter featuring hundreds of graphic bas-relief depictions of human sacrifice. The wall, which was built later in the site's history, contains shocking images of victorious warriors armed with weapons and their brutally dismembered dead victims. Whoever carved the relief spared none of the gory details, making sure to include severed limbs and heads, scattered organs, skewered eyeballs, and bones. Cerro Sechin seems to have been an administrative and ceremonial center that served political and religious purposes, but little is known about the culture who built it, leaving experts with little to go on when it comes to interpreting the violent artwork. The images may reference warfare or a specific battle or rebellion, or they may be more spiritual in nature, 
perhaps portraying demigods and other mythical characters. Based on the level of detail in the carvings, some have suggested that the site served as a lab for anatomical studies. Either way, it's clear that the Kazma Sechin culture had an advanced knowledge of the human body for its time. Cerro Sechin was abandoned for unknown reasons around 800 BC, roughly the same time that other ancient ceremonial and public centers in the region declined. Gunji Womp Located in a forest less than an hour outside of New Haven, Connecticut, the Gunji Womp site contains evidence of hundreds or even thousands of years of human occupation. Characterized by multiple stone chambers, rock piles, rings of stones, and mysterious carvings, the ancient settlement is filled with a confusing mixture of Native American and colonial artifacts, with the oldest finds dating as far back as 2000 BC. Among the most notable finds at Gunji Womp are a stone chamber featuring the astronomical alignment of the equinoxes and a formation of large quarried stones arranged in two concentric circles. There are also multiple stone chambers that archaeologists believe were root cellars, but truthfully do not know the purpose of. Other discoveries include Native American pottery fragments and arrowheads, as well as colonial-era china, buttons, coins, tobacco pipes, glass bottle and window fragments, bricks, and animal bones. But none of these artifacts are helpful in determining what the stone chambers were used for. On the surface, it's clear that the 100-acre site was repurposed multiple times throughout its history, but archaeologists have struggled to make sense of the muddled mess of structures and artifacts or put together a precise timeline or order to Gunji Womp's occupation. One of the more far-flung theories, put forth mostly by non-academic investigators, is that the settlement is of pre-Columbian Celtic origins and was built in the 6th century by Christian monks fleeing persecution in Europe. But no evidence points toward this as a likely possibility, despite the discovery in Newfoundland, Canada in recent years of a pre-Columbian Norse population in North America. Some people even believe that there are alien connections to Gunji Womp, citing the alleged presence of energy vortexes at the site based on occasional detectable spikes in electromagnetic activity, which geologists more convincingly attribute to the quartz, granite, and magnetite rocks at the site. But in all fairness, the mystery surrounding Gunji Womp and modern scholars' failure to come up with a more comprehensive explanation of its history open the door to these types of beliefs. Thanks for watching! If you'd like to learn about more mysterious ancient places, let me know in the comments below. And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. See you later! Bye!